1973, President Richard Nixon signed an act into law that would forever change the way endangered species are protected in the United States. The act, known simply as the Endangered Species Act, is one of the most powerful tools that exist to conserve plants and animals in the U.S. That being said, the power of the act is a major source of controversy. I'm Peter Kleinhens, and I want to take you along as I seek to learn more about an amazing animal that has ended up right in the middle of that controversy. Let's find out who is fighting and fighting for the fisher, and try to understand how an innovative approach to its conservation could become a model for how to balance the interests of us humans with the protection of rare species in this country. Since I was a little kid, I've had a list of animals I wanted to see in North America. Nerdy, I know. But one of the animals I hoped to see more than any other was a fisher. These members of the weasel family are the size of a large house cat, but they can take down prey much larger than they are. Fishers are probably most famous for being a major predator of porcupines. That makes them really cool as far as I'm concerned. I recently had the opportunity to talk to the world authority on fishers, Dr. Roger Powell, he was passionate about the fisher, but he did not hesitate to tell me about the trouble they're in. They are uh, highly adept predators that uh, have gone through really tough times. Turns out with fishers, the beauty killed the beast. Female fishers were just knocked down gorgeous, and their pelts were worth more than any other pelts out there. And Geez, when a guy in the woods who was, who was logging or, or, or doing other work in the woods found a fisher track, he'd follow it and follow it un, until he found the fisher. Hunting and trapping caused the fisher to decline all over their range in North America, but they've managed to bounce back everywhere except the Pacific Northwest. We need to try to understand why the populations in the Pacific Northwest have not come back, have not recovered. In the heart of their range in the Pacific Northwest, teams of researchers in Southern Oregon are following fishers and trapping them to this day. But these days, the traps aren't meant to kill fishers. They're meant to hold them so that they can be tranquilized. Once the fishers are asleep, a slew of data is collected from each animal. Blood is drawn, teeth are measured, and yeah, even scat is collected from the animal to look at their diet and parasites. Once the fisher has been processed, it wakes up and is released back into the forest. The researchers collect this data to figure out as much as they can about fisher biology. This is important because while hunting and trapping pressures tapered off, another potential threat to the fisher in the Pacific Northwest has not. Logging. To learn more about the relationship between logging and fishers, I drove down to Anderson, California to the headquarters of a giant in Pacific Northwest logging, Sierra Pacific Industries. Sierra Pacific is a family owned company that produces wood products. Uh, we also have an additional business where we produce renewable biomass energy and we have uh, just short of 4,000 family wage jobs in rural parts of the state of California and the state of Washington. Not surprisingly, a timber company as large as Sierra Pacific Industries owns a lot of land, as in 1.6 million acres of land. Whether they want to be or not, this means that they must be up to speed on what happens to the Pacific Fisher. Sierra Pacific owns timberlands basically within the Fisher's current range in Northern California, all the way down the Sierras to just about where the Fisher starts in the Southern Sierras. So we kind of play a somewhat important role in the home, historic home range of the Pacific Fisher. In 2004, the Pacific population of the Fisher became a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act after years of petitioning by environmental groups. In 2010, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who oversees species conservation under the Endangered Species Act, was sued for not moving ahead with Pacific fisher protection. 
the environmental groups argued that the Pacific fisher had yet to recover and that something needed to be done soon to save the fisher in this portion of its range. There are certain species that are wide ranging, but they have evolved in different conditions and different ecosystems sometimes. And so uh, the Endangered Species Act recognizes the concept of a distinct population. And that's important. It may not be even the largest part of the population, but it's, it's an important part evolutionarily, biologically. So, you know, that determination has been made that the Pacific fisher is not like other fishers. As things evolved and the likelihood of listing started to come on, listing under the Endangered Species Act, we began to look more seriously about how could we help the fisher. One way to help it would be to start moving it back through the Sierras uh, back to some of its historic range. 40 fishers were translocated from the Oregon-California border to a timber management area near Paradise, California between 2009 and 2011. Sierra Pacific Industries made a gamble, but they were able to work out a deal with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a result. Here we are inviting and in potential endangered species onto our property, so we began talking with the Fish and Wildlife Service and negotiated what's called a CCAA, a Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. Effectively, the service looks at what we've offered and they decide whether or not that's adequate for the fisher. And then we decide if we can afford it and live with it. And we signed the deal. We also signed an MOU that brought in North Carolina State University, the Department of Fish and Game, SPI, and the Fish and Wildlife Service to jointly start to move fishers. The CCAA gives us protection that if in the future the fishers listed, what we've agreed to in the CCAA is all we have to do. Currently, a timber harvest unit is shut down if a fisher den is found within a quarter mile of the unit, so a deal like this makes sense. If the Pacific fisher gets listed under the Endangered Species Act, further restrictions would likely be placed on the Pacific Northwest timber industry. This could create a frustrating situation for the industry, because fishers are notorious for moving huge distances and for being very secretive. And we're trying to figure out where they are on the landscape by taking a series of points um, relative to where the signal is coming from of, of the collar that the animal is wearing. So we're doing our very best to narrow down the area that that, that fisher is living and, and interacting with the environment at that time to the best of our ability. Because fishers are so elusive, Researchers combine radio tracking with an increasingly popular way to monitor the movements of mammals, camera trapping. Fisher biologists put motion sensitive cameras in known fisher habitat and lure the fishers in with different scents. The researchers then go back and check these cameras to see what they happen to catch. The combination of radio tracking and camera trapping lets both researchers and timber companies know where fishers are and how they're responding to timber management. Our task right now is really to understand how much logging can you do, especially clear-cut logging, and still have fishers at some viable level? And, and we're still looking into that, and that's part of what's gonna come out of this study, we hope. Part of our company's objective is to know the science, so we wanna know if, we're, if we manage our timberland in this way, will it affect fishers? Knowing how fishers utilize the landscape could inform management decisions if the fisher becomes listed, because with listing, comes potential problems for a company like Sierra Pacific Industries. As soon as it goes from not listed to listed, it gets federal protection against the individual mortality of any animal. Um, that's why we're working on a CCAA. I mean, to manage successfully, that's impossible. I mean, it just is impossible. On the other hand, can you manage so that it's a positive outcome for the fisher in the long run and maybe have take? That's why you need a permission slip. As I began to learn more about the Pacific Fisher, I began to notice many parallels between the Pacific Fisher and the Northern Spotted Owl. The Northern Spotted Owl was at the center of the so-called logging wars that occurred in the 1980s and 1990s due to its dependence on the old growth forest that was being rapidly cut down at the time. And guess what? The Pacific Fisher likes these forests too. Their populations are most dense and and do best in old growth forests. Well, that's often the same habitat for the northern spotted owl. That could often be the same habitat for the marbled merlet. Both of those species are on the Endangered Species Act already because of the loss of old growth forests. The clear cutting of old growth forests, the conversion to industrial monoculture 
plantation tree farms that are ecologically closer to a cornfield in ecological value than to a forest. And so the fisher is just another in a string of species that's in trouble because we've cut too much old growth for it. Most log mills these days don't process big trees anymore, since they can often do more with less. But another logging controversy left over from the logging war days remains, clear cutting. And Sierra Pacific Industries is a company that practices this method of logging, also known as even age management. I think a more descriptive term, a lot of people refer to even age management as clear cutting, uh, because that's how we do it. We harvest the trees in a spot. We don't do that exclusively. We're not a one size fits all kind of thing. We, we roughly 65 to 70% of our land is feasible to be managed even age. Clear cutting is the most intensive form of timber management, but the jury is still out on whether or not this is bad for fishers. That's still some, an area of study and we don't, we don't know that logging activity necessarily has a, a deleterious effect on fishers and their behavior. It's certainly you know, uh, a real possibility that they do. The even age management, uh, while a lot of people have different thoughts about it, we believe mimics uh, the natural systems for regeneration uh, way closer. As I gazed out over one clear cut after another at the Sterling management area, I couldn't help but wonder how such a seemingly destructive method of logging could not be hard on fishers. But as I talked to professionals in the field, I began to see the other side. Clearly, socially, it is less acceptable. Um, it is interesting that in a fire-dominated, disturbance-adapted forest, that we somehow think cutting trees is not part of that system, when it really is indeed the way that system functions. Um, clearly, we don't do it in the same extent or duration or timing, uh, but the ecology of that system is designed to handle harvest. What we see right now are the most extreme conditions existing for number one catastrophic disease and catastrophic fire. And where we should have 50, 75, maybe 100 trees per acre, we have many instances right now where we are seeing 500, 1,000, 1,500 trees per acre. The woods and the fishers and the animals that live in them aren't static, they are always changing. Their habitat and their existence will be more threatened than if we have a well-planned um, sales program that, you know, it, they don't go in and clear cut anymore on the BLM Forest Service lands. They don't do swaths down here. Much of the fighting between logging industries and environmental groups today stems from the massive loss of logging jobs in the last 30 years. We have lost probably in Oregon in the last 25 years, I would, probably in the neighborhood of 40, 50,000 direct jobs in another equal quantity than direct jobs. This is often blamed completely on the Northern Spotted Owl, but I knew there had to be more to it than that. There's a modern timber industry and there's an old dying timber industry. In Western Oregon, there are about 55 lumber mills left. Now, there were twice that many in 1995, and there were twice as many workers. So there's half as many mills today, but the capacity of those mills, they can produce 25% more lumber than the, the mills could in 1995. So you, what that tells us is there's a lot of automation, efficiency going on, not as many jobs. Logging especially clear-cut logging, can be a complicated issue. On one hand, you are harvesting a natural resource that plants and animals depend on. On the other hand, every one of us uses wood products every day, and a lot of jobs are supported by the timber industry. The more I talked to both sides, the more I saw just how complex conserving a species like the Pacific Fisher can be. In the business we're in with 4,000 employees, we want to produce more than less. And so that, those are the kinds of, like I say, hard choices that sometimes uh, we don't uh, necessarily get lauded in the press for, but at the same time, uh, those are the kinds of decisions we're willing to make because we think they're the right sound decisions to make. It's a fundamentally flawed business model that is predicated on basic extinction of, of, of species and the ecosystem. And if that's the case, and eventually the business will go extinct. That's based on that model. If you think this is easy, and you think loggers are just, you know, the brute down the street, you're wrong. It's a very sophisticated, 
very knowledgeable. There's very dedicated professionals that log. There's very dedicated professionals that organize and lay out the logging. There's very dedicated professionals that monitor and make sure that we're protecting the wildlife and water quality. My concern is that the environmental groups want to control everything about forest management without having the expertise and the background and the knowledge of how to do it well. It's tough to be a conservationist because you're going against uh, people that just want to, they want to make some money, they want an easy time, you know, they're, they're thoughtless or, or heartless or a combination of both. And so, you know, it's often a fight, uh, a social, political debate that has to occur. And, and the Endangered Species Act has set a framework for, for such debates. As the number of species listed under the Endangered Species Act has increased, the controversy associated with it has increased as well. The Endangered Species Act is a very powerful law once a biological determination is made that the species is in danger of extinction. And uh, then the law is, the full force and effect of the law comes into play. And that can uh, bother certain people, people whose activities were the very thing that were causing the species to go towards extinction. DSA has become, become almost a tool for litigation. And it has rendered our industry um, pretty much impotent. We don't deal with things prospectively, we deal with things reactively as a species. And so the problem is, is you have a, a political crisis and there are calls to override the Endangered Species Act and things like that. And it's like, uh, somehow we need to get ahead of the curve and address these problems earlier. And if we did, the crisis, the inevitable political crisis would be less. Sierra Pacific Industries offers a prime example of this mentality in action. That's really why we're working on mechanisms that get us a, this is how we're going to manage, that's why we think this management doesn't affect the fisher, and therefore we hopefully will have that in position if the government lists. We're still actively submitting information to hopefully make them not list. Monitoring of fishers at the Sterling Management Area continues to this day and everyone I talk to seems pleased with how it's going. We're, we're playing a cooperative role to understand how to successfully manage forest and fishers together. They're surviving and they're giving birth and they're doing things that other fishers and other natural populations do. We can do so much and learn so much studying fishers. They're just, it, 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 they're just really cool, besides being beautiful. The story of the Pacific Fisher Translocation Project is one of the most unique and fascinating stories of wildlife conservation that I've ever come across. As I met these people and learned more about Pacific Fishers, I realized that my perspective of wildlife conservation was completely skewed. When people work cooperatively towards a goal, no matter how different their perspectives might be, great things can happen and everyone can benefit. But of all the beneficiaries of the Fisher Translocation Project, it's ultimately the Pacific Fisher that will benefit most. This incredible animal has been through so much, but its future seems secure as people stop fighting the Fisher and start fighting for it.